I have two brief questions I'd like to ask, if I may. Hi, welcome to Left Foot Media. My name is Brendan Malone, and you're watching The Daily Question. Today's question of the day, what are the historical falsehoods in Outlaw King? Now, the reason I'm asking that question is because about a week or so back, one of my subscribers got in contact with me and said, Hey, Brendan, have you seen the brand new Netflix movie Outlaw King? This film about Robert the Bruce starring Chris Pine O'Clean as Robert the Bruce. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. So I watched the film a couple of days ago, and I thought I would focus in on some of the big historical falsehoods that this film presents, because there are some big ones in here, and then I would finish up by sharing my thoughts uh, just in general about the film, regardless of the, the historical lies that are presented in this movie. Now, there are going to be spoilers today, so if you don't want anything spoiled, go and watch the film, come back and watch this video after you've watched Outlaw King on Netflix. So let's look at the historical falsehoods first of all. And I thought I would focus just primarily, because there's probably lots of things that you could talk about, but the three main characters, because they really are the sort of the pivotal hub of the drama and what we see playing out on screen in this film. And there's there's a couple of big historical fallacies in here that I think are worth talking about. So first of all, Edward the First, Edward the Longshanks. Now, Edward the Longshanks was actually a taller than average man. This is how he gets this title, Edward the Longshanks. He's taller than the average bloke living at the time, and so he cuts quite an imposing figure, and that becomes even, I guess, more of an issue when it's coupled with the fact that he's quite temperamental. So you get a very imposing king here. Now, again, we have a portrayal of Edward the Longshanks where he isn't tall. This happened in, in uh, Braveheart, Mel Gibson's movie as well. I don't know why they don't take advantage of such an obvious visual thing because filmmaking is supposed to be visual and, and with something as simple as getting a taller actor to play that role or even getting an actor and filling their boots a bit so they're a bit taller actually will give you a sense of how imposing he was as a king and it's a visual cue that does it for you. You don't have to do any acting, just their presence actually creates the sense of how imposing this king was. Now. This portrayal, I don't think, is as good as what we saw in Braveheart, because for all of its historical faults, at least Edward the Longshanks actually felt like quite an imposing and frightening kind of guy to be around when he was doing his kingly stuff. This guy, not so much. And so I think it's a real shame, as I see that that visual cue is missing here yet again. Remember um, the first Star Wars film, A New Hope? And what you have is that amazing visual cue in the very opening shot when that Star Destroyer swoops overhead and it just keeps going and going and it's huge and massive. And what it tells you is about the power and the strength of the Empire, the villains in this story. And you don't have to say a word, it's just all visual. The same sort of thing could have been achieved by getting a taller actor to play Edward the Longshanks. So, so that's again, is sort of missing here. Uh, Edward the Longshanks, unlike what is told to us in this film, Outlaw King, he did not die before the Battle of Loudon Hill. Now, the Battle of Loudon Hill is the crescendo final battle of this movie, Outlaw King. But Loudon Hill, that battle happened in May 1307. Edward the Longshanks did not die until July 1307. He did die on the road, he did die of dysentery, but he died after the Battle of Loudon Hill. He wasn't there. He dies after that battle though. In this film, they have him dying before the battle, and then Edward II takes over. Now, one of the other things about uh, this, his death is the scene they have in this film where he's talking about uh, he wants his bones to be carried into battle. You know, I want my body boiled and my bones carried into, into, into battle, uh, to future battles. Uh, the historians that I've read seem to think that that's an apocryphal tale, that it's dubious that that was actually said, yet that is featured in this film. Now, then we have... Edward II who takes over, Edward the Shortshanks, I don't know, but Edward Jr. takes over, and this film, the portrayal of Edward, is just all wrong. So in this movie, Edward is a cruel psychopath, but that's not who Edward the Longshanks' son, Edward II, actually was, according to the historical record. He was actually pretty inept at being king. And interestingly enough, one of the things that apparently that some of his contemporaries accused him of was, was that, that they sort of, I think they made fun of him, or there's a bit of ridicule and disdain about the fact that he was actually more, he would stop and talk to the common man. He connected with people on the street, quote unquote, the man on the street, quote unquote. Uh, and, and he wasn't really an aloof ruling class sort of leader. So 
he's kind of the exact opposite of this cruel, cunning psychopath that they have him portrayed here as in this film. More importantly than that, though, and, th and this is really important, he was not at the Battle of Loudon Hill. Now, this is important because they have put him at the battle, they have him leading the armies, they have Edward the Longshanks dead, which he was not, so this whole thing is just completely falsified, and then they have him at the end of this battle engaging in a personal one-on-one -on -one sword fight with none other than Robert the Bruce. That did not happen, he was not there, and that sword fight is just so absurd when you think about it. First of all, this battle between these two kings quote-unquote, is taking place, and all of the Scotsmen are basically are standing around, and, and the vast majority are oblivious to what would be actually a very serious spectacle taking place in their midst at the end of a battle, and they're all just oblivious to it until the very final moments of this battle. Not only that, but the battle, the sword fight, just goes nowhere. They, they both sort of peter out, and effectively, uh, Robert the Bruce, well, he wins because he's a bit less tired than, than what Edward uh, Jr. is. And then Edward Jr. gets up screaming, help, help, and then sort of runs off into the distance. It's kind of like a weird Scooby-Doo ending. I'll get you, pesky kids, I'll be back. And the whole thing is just, it's just such an anticlimactic sort of ending. Now... Obviously, the reason they've done this is because, and they've completely presented this false version of history, is because they set up at the beginning of the film, uh, Edward and Edward Jr. and Robert the Bruce having a wager, a friendly wager, quote unquote, a bit of a rivalry between the two of them, over a sword fight. But it's a friendly sword fight. And so this should really be a crescendo moment. That's why they falsified everything. But it just isn't. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Because of course there is the main character, Robert the Bruce, we need to talk about. And this film has not presented an historically accurate depiction of who Robert the Bruce is. Once again we have a film which has taken a complicated historical figure and they have presented him in a very, very black and white way. Very simplistic way in order to try and satisfy the demand to have a very clear-cut hero and virtuous good man who is leading the charge here. In actual fact, Robert the Bruce was much more complicated as a figure, and he is what you might call a questionable hero of sorts. Uh, the killing of John Common, which we see at the beginning of the film in that church, this is a very much uh, a black and white presentation of that killing. Uh, we have John Common basically threatening the life of, of Robert the Bruce in this movie, and he effectively he reacts. It's like a almost like a self defense sort of. I get better get him before he kills has me killed uh, by dobbing me into the king. But historians disagree about what actually went on there and what the heck uh, Robert the Bruce's real motivations were. It seems there's good evidence that he was quite an ambitious fellow and he wanted to be king. He was not, as the movie portrays him, this guy who's like, I'm doing this for my people, I love my people, I love democracy, I'm doing this for the people. Uh, he seemed quite ambitious. He actually changed sides a couple of times in the, in the fight between England and Scotland. So that's, a, that's an interesting little point of history that sort of gets sidelined in all of this. Um, but this incident with John Common, uh, the way it's portrayed is not accurate. That's not how he actually died. It's a lot more brutal and a bit more drawn out than that. Uh, and also there are historians who say, well, it's possible that it was actually premeditated because he was afraid that John Common was actually about to take the Scottish throne. And so he thought he'd better get in first because he was quite ambitious himself. So Robert the Bruce is actually quite a complicated historical figure, as a lot of these guys are. But this film definitely presents a very, very black and white simplistic uh, version of who he was with a lot of the truth just stripped out of it. Uh, in order to create, uh, the, I guess, the, the storytelling narrative, to create the good guy who we don't question too much. Now, all in all, though, how does this film stack up? When you, I guess, t uh, take into account or leave aside, however you want to put it, the historical falsehoods that are presented in this movie, how does it stack up in spite of those things? Well, it's actually not that good in the end. It's, this is the funny thing about this film, and I think this is what, for me, was just so odd. They have crafted this film with deliberate historical falsehoods in it, but the reason they've done it and taken this what you might call poetic license, but I think it's way more than poetic, poetic license when you completely falsify history, and that's what they've done here. They've done this 
in order to create this big climactic battle at the end and this big showdown between Edward Jr. and Robert the Bruce. So you've got these two opposing characters throughout the film, but here's the funny thing, they don't really take advantage of it properly. The film starts with this opening sequence, which by the way I think is one of the, the, the more impressive sequences in the film actually, where they have this continuous tracking shot in and out of this tent in this encampment, and, and there's various bits of things that are, that are happening and playing out, and, and the action is continuous, it's just one long shot. And it's really quite an impressive little sequence there. But in the beginning of this film you have um, Edward Jr. and Robert the Bruce who have this quote unquote friendly uh, wager over a sword fight and then of course this is the foreshadowing moment that's, that's supposed to be setting up the final sword fight that they have at the end of the film now what you would expect though in between that first sword fight and that final sword fight between these two characters is that there would be a building tension between the two of them throughout the rest of the film that basically everything is driving us to this final climactic moment. You've made all this false history up so you can get these two characters together to have this big climactic battle that we've been building up to and so they should be intertwined. But in actual fact Edward II is he's not even a main character for most of this film. He, he arrives at the end really in a big way, but he's like a secondary character for a lot of this film. He doesn't play a big enough role to actually create the tension between these two men that should be there and, and the whole thing should be building up to this big final crescendo. And then of course the final crescendo is just so flat because he sort of has a funny drawn out tired sword fight and then he just leaves. And, and there's no sense of climax in this and, and you, you get to the end of that battle and you're like, oh, oh, that's right, they had a sword fight at the beginning of the film, didn't they, all the way back then at the beginning. And so that what should have been a big moment of foreshadowing where you go, oh yeah, this is the big climax, it's just all missing from the film. Now this is a film though that, that you've got great actors in this, so the acting is good, uh, the dialogue is great, you've got some absolutely beautiful visuals and the costuming in this is just, it's, it's just something to behold. But the storytelling, it's not complete here and something just doesn't come together like it should and this is, as I said, this is the irony, you've completely falsified history so you have every reason to actually make this work because you've created a false version of history in order to, uh, I'm assuming, to improve the storytelling but the storytelling is just, it feels incomplete. It's, it's, I guess it's like putting on a, a, on a boot but then not tightening up the laces and everything just isn't pulled together tightly. And it's a real shame because all of the chess pieces are on the board in this movie for something that, that could have been actually quite great. You know, as I said, the visuals are stunning. The costuming's amazing. The actors, the acting, it, it's all there. This really could have been quite a, an impressive successor, uh, you know, unofficial successor, unofficial sequel to, to Braveheart in some ways but it just doesn't bring the story together and it just feels a little bit anticlimactic. And it's a shame because when you look at the real history, there's a lot of complex stuff there that was well worth delving into. It just feels like it doesn't all come together. If you've seen the film, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments section below. And if you like the content I'm creating and you'd like to see more of it, then please support me on Subscribestar or Patreon. There is a link for both in the video description below. That's right, I can hear my theme music too. I'll see you next week on The Daily Question.